Oh, yes, it is. Okay. I think they handled that back in the back. I'll step back. Uh, it gives me real pleasure to be able to introduce Abigail Mace this morning. She's going to talk to us about our pedagogical ancestors. And she hails from OBU. You need to read her bio in our program. But I'll tell you, a few years ago, I ran into Martha Hilly. And I said, well, Abigail Mays is in our state now. And she said, you are so fortunate. She was one of our best. So, <laughs> yeah. we're glad to have her here. And we can't wait to hear what she has to share with us this morning. Cell phones off, please. performance training has taught me that right here applause. I must uh, bow. Thank you so much, Karen, for that kind introduction. Um, sound looks okay. A little bit of feedback back here. Is there a way we can adjust that? Okay. Oh, that's much better. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so, thank you all so much for coming today. Uh, I was uh, in the previous session and Chimbawat, am I saying her name correctly? Uh, she mentioned how um, the, uh, Haydn was speaking about Beethoven, and I thought that was just a perfect segue into this presentation. So thank you for mentioning that. Uh, so thank you all for being here today. Uh, my topic combines historically informed performance, which um, is also known as, uh, sometimes abbreviated as HIP, H-I-P, and uh, piano pedagogy. As a pianist and harpsichordist myself, um, the interaction of these two areas has always been of particular interest to me. The focus of this presentation is to establish a connection between our current teaching practices and those of the past, hopefully gaining some perspective, um, affirmation in what we do, and also perhaps a few new ideas, new ways of, of teaching things. Um, I'm excited to share this topic, particularly in light of the theme of this conference uh, this year, which is the music that connects us, um, because I think uh, what, I'm, what you will hear is that there's a distinct connection, not just amongst ourselves, but even uh, amongst the whole profession uh, from centuries past. So my first question is, can teaching connect us? So it's obvious that the performance of music connects us due to its powerful ability to communicate, um, as it is a universal language after all. Um, Oxford Dictionary's de definition of connect is to, quote, to bring together or into contact so that a real or notional link is established, end quote. Um, so I think that uh, uh, teaching does connect us, but paradoxically, teaching is often a very isolated profession particularly teaching out of the home studio, or even in a shared work environment because uh, the busyness of our lives leave little time to truly connect about um, teaching principles. Anthony Williams writes in the Panel Teachers Survival Guide, which I actually picked up at the last in-person MTNA conference in Spokane. Um, it's a nice book. Um, he writes, quote, there are inherent problems with teaching in isolation. It often makes us less comfortable with or open to new ideas and techniques. We are unlikely to question the way we teach unless we experience other teachers' approaches with similar pupils, witness teaching strategies and performance ideas from other professional pianists, or discuss piano teaching with teachers from different backgrounds. So um, how is it that um, even as we're isolated, often even more isolated this year, of course, due to COVID, um, how is it that we are connected? I would um, venture to say that we're connect connected through our shared experiences, through administrative aspects of 
advertising fees and scheduling and equipment, musical, musical aspects, choosing repertoire, teaching rhythm to a six-year-old, um, teaching the nuances of articulation to a college student, um, technical aspects of bench height, posture, hand position, uh, overcoming tension in playing, um, aspects of attitude, including how to motivate a student, um, how to teach a student to practice well, um, and also working with parents. Um, and then in addition to that, we choose additions, we enter our students in competitions, and more recently, um, uh, learned, we learned how to submit a video audition with camera and landscape and performer visible head to toe. <laughs> We've done a lot of that this year. Um, so these are all things that we experience sometimes even on a daily basis. Um, so even if we never see each other, we are connected through our shared experiences. So I would like to take uh, this concept one more step forward and that is, are, can we even be connected to teachers in the past? Uh, since we see that connection is what links us together both tangibly and theoretically, uh, I'd like to take this concept a step further. Could we also see a connection with those music teachers that were centuries before us? Uh, so much of the research on uh, that, that compares our teaching with the past tends to emphasize the differences that we have with the past. But um, as I've been reading through these treatises, I've um, because of my historical performance background, um, I've done a lot of reading of old, dusty pedagogical treatises, and I've always been struck by uh, similarities that we have uh, with these teachers of the past. Uh, and it seems that I may not be alone. Edith Anacher, who is the translator of Leopold Mozart's treatise, which we'll look into a little bit later, she writes, uh, quote, truth is unchanging, and his teaching, referring to Leopold Mozart, remains in essence as true today as it was in 1756, end quote. Uh, but I would encourage you not to take my word for it. Let's look at what these early music teachers said and um, you can form your own opinion. I think that you will find affirmation, uh, a lot of practical advice, and even um, be struck by some of the humor uh, in these texts. So on to the treatises themselves. Uh, I reviewed uh, six treatises, all from the 18th century. Uh, four of them uh, are keyboard treatises. One is a flute treatise and one is a violin treatise. Um, the OMTA or the MTA in general uh, have the reputation for being the, the main group for piano teachers, but we do try to be more inclusive and include other instruments as well. So I wanted to um, put some other instruments in there too. So the first treatise, I'm going to talk about these uh, just briefly uh, in order that they were published, uh, is a treatise by Francois Couvrin, which is called The Art of Playing the Harpsichord, in French, L'Art de Toucher de Clavecin, and it was written in 1717. Uh, Francois Couvrin lived in Paris and worked for the French court of Louis XIV. His treatise on playing the harpsichord was published as a result of the popularity of his first book of um, the suites, which we know as Pièce de Clavecin. Um, and then we have Johann Joachim Quantz. Um, his treatise is called Essay of a Method for Playing the Transverse Flute. Versuch einer Anweisung in Flute Transverse zu spielen, if you speak German. Um, he, uh, Johann Joachim Quantz, worked for the Prussian court of King Frederick the Great, as we love him to call King Freddy, King Freddy the Great, who was a, also a good amateur flute player. That's more of a joke in the historical <laughs> uh, performance arenas. We, we talk about him as King Freddy. Um, Quantz, Quantz's greatest writing on music is his essay of the method for playing the transverse flute, uh, which would serve as the model for a number of treatises that would follow. And then the third treatise is by Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, who was the second surviving son of Johann Sebastian and uh, Johann's first wife, Maria Barbara. Um, Carl Philip also worked for the Prussian court of King Frederick the Great, actually at the same time that Johann Joachim Fonts uh, worked for him. His essay on the true art of playing keyboard instruments, um, often referred to as just the essay or Versuch, which is the first German word um, that is, you can see at the top of the page there. Um, his essay of, a, of the true art of playing keyboard instruments was highly influential during Bach's time. 
during the uh, Carl Wilkman New Box Plan. Joseph Haydn called it the school of all schools, and Beethoven even assigned it to his student, Carl Chamney. And um, perhaps many of you have seen this painting. Uh, I just wanted to bring this up here because it actually shows uh, Carl Philip Mendelbach and his patron, um, King Frederick the Great. This is the famous painting of uh, King Frederick playing his transverse flute in the Prussian court. He liked to play his flute um, often, even every night. And seated at the harpsichord, you can see the back of the player, that is Carl Philip Emanuel Bach. So not only is this a great work of visual art, but it connects us to our um, musical art as well. And then the fourth treatise is by Leopold Mozart, uh, who is famously the father of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who he tirelessly supported, taught, and promoted. The same year that uh, Wolfgang was born, actually, uh, Leopold uh, published this treatise on the fundamentals of violin playing. This work was known as the most important violin method of the time and is still held in high esteem today, but mainly due to the window that it provides into the pedagogical um, practices that were taught to Wolfgang Amadeus. But I think you'll learn uh, my point from this presentation is that it's much more universally applicable than just for that reason. And the picture of Leopold, obviously he was the one standing behind the harpsichord with, with the violin and um, that was his uh, two children he had as an instrument. And then uh, Daniel Gottlob Turk. You probably, um, you probably know of this person more as a composer of pedagogical works for the keyboard, um, but he was actually an outstanding, well-read professor of music theory, composition, and music history at the University of Halle in Germany. Uh, he was very active as a director of a number of ensembles and concert series in Halle, Germany as well. And his school of clavier playing was one of the last in a long tradition of pedagogical treatises um, about the keyboard. And then, last but not least, uh, the sixth treatise that I reviewed was by Muzio Clementi, who is Italian by birth, but lived and worked in England for most of his life, so he's much more associated with that country now. Um, he was a great keyboardist, a teacher, um, and a publisher of music, and also a piano builder. Uh, as a piano teacher, he was highly sought after, so much so that he could afford to turn away royalty, and he charged one guinea per lesson, which by my calculations uh, was about $240 in today's uh, standards. So, very sought after teacher. His pedagogical works include the introduction to the art of playing the pianoforte and his collection of graded works, Gradius ad Parnassum, which was widely used by students. So those are our six treatises that I'm going to be pulling information from today. Uh, we will be uh, reading all of them at length, but wherever there's a topic that applies specifically um, to what we're talking about, I'll pull that from there. Um, perhaps conspicuously absent from this list is a, uh, of 18th century pedagogical treatises is any treatise by Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, as Reginald Garrett puts it in his book, Famous Pianists and Their Technique, he writes, quote, Bach has left us little direct comment. What we know regarding his own performances and his thoughts on technique must be gotten largely from his associates, and particularly his son, Carl Philip Emanuel. So that's another reason why the CPE Bach treatise is so well-loved right now, because the interest in Johann Sebastian and trying to get a window into uh, what Johann, how he would have taught, um, the closest we can get is his uh, son, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach. So that's exciting to have that window into the past, um, pretty close to Johann Sebastian. So um, these treatises can be very, very specific um, and very thorough about very tiny details like when to start a trill, how to play a certain trill, if it has this kind of a swiggle and not that kind of a swiggle, and <laughs> how to play double dotted notes and things like that. But that's not the focus of this presentation. Um, the, what I did when I was reviewing these treatises was to really um, read through them for what was uh, practically applicable to, in a broader, more general sense, to our teaching today. So in doing that, um, I came up with uh, four categories that I want to share with you. 
and just a few points from each one. The first one is a practical category, and that's going to include age to begin, uh, musical instruction, um, posture and hand position, and a note about tempo difficulties in playing. And then the second category is the musical category, which includes expressive playing and vocal inspiration. And these were just um, topics that tended to crop up amongst several treatises where each person addressed that and, and had a, a thought about that. So that's how I came up with these, um, these categories. And then the peripheral category, which is at, uh, I will talk about the attributes of a good teacher, according to these treatises. Uh, competitions or playing for feedback and um, support of the arts and then a bonus category so if you stay all the way to the end of this presentation you will get to hear some pretty interesting <laughs> um, things that I, I, I found in these treatises that maybe don't quite necessarily apply to today but are very, very interesting to share so those are the categories so moving on to get some water because there's going to be quite a bit of reading here because the nature of this is that there's going to be a lot of quotes so hold on to your hands so the age to begin in the treatises that are reviewed they agree that the optimal age to begin musical instruction is around six to eight years old but they don't eliminate older beginners even adult Francois Cobran writes, quote, the proper age at which children should begin is from six to seven years. Not that that need exclude persons of a more advanced age, but naturally, in order to mold and form the hands for playing the harpsichord, the earlier, the better. And then Twerk writes, the earlier one begins, the better. Kind of ends exactly the same way that Cobran writes. Uh, particularly if the size and strength of the fingers allow it, say around the seventh or eighth year. It is of course not impossible that adults can still learn to play, but they will find it difficult to attain any great dexterity. And then Quantz writes a little bit more generally, but still focusing on the early, uh, starting early. He writes, quote, he who wishes to distinguish himself in music must not begin the study of it too late if he sets about it at an age when his energies are no longer vigorous or when his throat, referring to singing or, or flute playing, or fingers are not flexible, he will not go very far. Looking at advice from today, uh, the general age to begin does not change greatly, though teachers of our time are more likely to consider taking students at a younger age, say five or five. Marianne Usler writes in The Well-Tempered Keyboard Player, which was published in 1991, quote, although many American children are adjusting to learning environments earlier than first grade, many teachers still believe that the seven-year-old is the ideal beginner, and they suggest that music lessons be started at this time, unless particular talent or unusual interest warrants otherwise. And James Bastian, in writing in 1995, says, quote, the beginning piano student generally is between seven to 10 years old. Teachers have diverse opinions regarding an optimum age, beginning age. Some children may be ready to begin lessons as early as five, while others would, want, would do better to wait until they are seven or eight. So while you can see there are some slight variations of thought, the change is very minimal. Beginning musical instruction around the six to eight range uh, tends to be still the norm. Uh, I myself, I began piano at age seven, so I fit right into that category. And then moving on to posture and hand position. Uh, we can see from, how many of you teach from Faber's Piano Adventures? <laughs> this is a very familiar page probably. It's the first, uh, the first uh, two pages of Unit 1 sitting at the piano. We can see from the first lesson of Faber's Piano Adventures lesson book, Primer Level, today's ideal posture and hand position at the sitting tall, elbows hanging, arms level with the keyboard, while using a rounded hand shape. I like what it says over on the right hand page, uh, number two, it says, it might be a little bit small for you to read that, but it says, quote, magic, your fingers are all the same length. Right, so if you do this, then all your fingers form a line and the same length. Uh, so that's, the, that's why we have that. 
So uh, if you look at the 18th century treatises, um, keyboardists generally focus on the same points while adding a few things that we um, do still do today. Kupron writes, quote, to be seated at the correct height, the undersurface of the elbows, wrists, and fingers should all be on one level. Therefore, a chair must be chosen which will allow this rule to be observed. And later he goes on to say, it will be necessary to place some additional support under the feet of young people. How many of you do that? <laughs> uh, varying in, in height as they grow so that their feet, not dangling in the air, may keep the body properly balanced, end quote. Carl Philip Emanuel Bach writes, when the performer is in the correct position with respect to height, his forearms are suspended slightly above the keyboard. In playing, the fingers should be arched and the muscles relaxed. Later, he says, those who play with flat, extended fingers suffer from one principal disadvantage in addition to awkwardness. The fingers, because of their length, are too far removed from the thumb. So some people like to say that these are the fingers and this is the thumb. I like to think of the thumb as a finger, but he's saying the fingers are removed from the thumb. Uh, Clementi writes, quote, the hand and arm should be held in a horizontal position, neither depressing nor raising the wrist. The seat should therefore be adjusted accordingly. The fingers and thumb should be placed over the keys, always ready to strike, bending the fingers in more or less in proportion to their length. Taking a look at our modern sources, we see that this instruction echoing across the ages. Bastion writes, quote, the hands, wrists, and forearms should be held in a straight line and the fingers should be curved. Anthony Williams writes in 2017, quote, the hand and fingers form a natural arch, meeting the tip of the thumb. A guide to a good hand position on the keyboard can be judged from the position of the thumb. Looking side on, adjust the height of the stool and wrist until there is an almost straight line from the tip of the thumb along the inner edge of the forearm. The tips of the fingers should rest on the key surface without a raised wrist. In general, the tip of the thumb should be just behind and to one side of the tip of the rounded second finger. So again, uh, the exact same advice that we had hundreds of years earlier. Moving on to tempo, I wanted to share this next piece of advice from the past with you because it's something that I think needs no comparison with our current um, literature because uh, I'm pretty sure we've all experienced this at one time or the other, and it is the issue of tempo continuity. Carl Philip Manuel Bach writes, quote, every effort must be made despite the beauty of detail to keep the tempo at the end of a piece exactly the same as at the beginning, an extremely difficult assignment. <laughs> Twerk writes, quote, many people will rush and others will make the opposite mistake, which is called dragging. <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> the teacher must carefully see to it that students maintain the original tempo until the very last note. Should reminders not produce results, one should resort to time beating AKA the Pro Metronome app on one's iPhone, <laughs> or call on the violin for help. <laughs> so, yeah, they liked to, uh, there was some advice in some of the treatises where uh, they said a good piano teacher also knows how to play the violin because one of the best ways to learn how to not stop and to follow the tempo is to play the violin with your student. So, that was another interesting piece of advice. Leopold Mozart writes, quote, Especially must the pupil be at great pains to end the piece in the same tempo in which he began it. He avoids in this way the common fault, which one observes in many musicians, who conclude a piece much faster than they began it. He must therefore, right from the beginning, start with a certain reasonable moderation, and then he can rely on being able to play correctly the rapid passages which occur in the piece. He must practice these difficult passages again and again, with great attention until he achieves the executive ability to play the whole piece at the correct tempo throughout. So again, uh, advice that I think we can never underestimate the helpfulness of a little affirmation that we are not alone, even in the scope of hundreds of years. So moving on to our next category, which is the musical category. So I think that when we consider the interpretation of particularly early music, the, the first word that comes to mind is often not um, expressivity. 
Um, instead, we might think of a list of rules, how to, when and how to trill, how to double dot, what type of articulation is appropriate for Baroque music, etc. But um, we'll see that this actually wasn't the case. Um, Anthony Williams, writing in 2017, he says, quote, interpretation is not a science, yet the subject attracts some inflexible rules from experts and can cause a lot of anxiety for inexperienced teachers. It was not uncommon for specialist Baroque performers in the latter half of the 20th century to expound with total conviction upon Baroque performing convention. Listen to these authentic Baroque performances today, as they are clearly mannered and idiosyncratic. While this is an unfortunate reputation that um, 18th century music has gained, um, I think it's becoming much more common that we hear much more expressive performances of this early literature. And um, maybe it's because they heard things like the following. Carl, they, they finally found these writings like the following. Carl Philip Emanuel Bach wrote, uh, quote, play from the soul, not like a trained bird. A keyboardist of such stamp deserves more praise than other musicians. So a keyboardist that plays from the soul. And also later he writes, a musician cannot move others unless he too is moved. He must of necessity feel all of the affects that he hopes to arouse in his audience, for the revealing of his own humor will stimulate a like humor in the listener. So of course, the 18th century um, had this theory of affect and where one movement of a piece would be in one particular affect or mood, I guess we could say. Um, so they're speaking kind of specifically to that, but I think it applies to um, just uh, playing expressively in general as well. Leopold Mozart wrote, quote, every effort must be made to put the player in the mood which reigns in the piece itself, in order thereby to penetrate the souls of the listeners and excite their emotions. In a word, all must be so played that the player himself be moved thereby. And Johann Joachim Quantz writes, quote, inner feeling, the singing of the soul, yields a great advantage in this regard. The beginner must therefore seek gradually to arouse this feeling in himself, for if he is not himself moved by what he plays, he cannot hope for any profit from his efforts, and he will never move others through his playing, which should be his real aim. I remember the first time that I came across these um, paragraphs. It's been quite a while now, because like I said, I've done quite a bit of work in the historically informed performance movement. So going back to these treatises has just been a natural part of my education. And I think it just kind of, the scales fell off of my eyes because um, I had felt myself kind of constricted, like, oh, am I playing this field the right way? Am I articulating this the right way? No, the, the end goal should uh, always be um, expression. And uh, if we look at a writer of the current time, Reginald Gary wrote, um, quote, to be sure, technique is physical. It is every bodily skill we possess at the keyboard, but it's worthless if the physical can't combine with the spiritual to express the deepest longings of our hearts and souls, our most sensitive musical conceptions and expressions. And then moving on to vocal inspiration, we can tell from the previous discussion that expression was very important, even in early music, but um, how would one go about playing expressively? Um, there was one opinion on this that seemed to be shared widely across the texts, um, so I wanted to share that with you. And that was for um, instrumentalists to listen to good singers and even study voice so that the musician could think in terms of song. On their instrument. And I think this is something that we've all done at one point or the other, made our students sing in their piano lesson, for example. Carl Philip Emanuel Bach writes, quote, above all, lose no opportunity to hear artistic singing. In so doing, the keyboardist will learn to think in terms of song. Indeed, it is a good practice to sing instrumental melodies in order to reach an understanding of their correct performance. And Leopold Mozart writes, quote, who is not aware that singing is at all times the aim of every instrumentalist, because one must always approximate to nature as nearly as possible. So while we would be not, we would not be surprised at all to hear that, I think, coming from uh, Chopin, for example, 
Um, it's very illuminating, again, to see this coming from Carl Feldman and Bach, from Mozart. And then Quantz also writes, quote, every instrumentalist must strive to execute that which is cantabile as a good singer executes it. We'll also find this sentiment in current pedagogy. Garrick writes, quote, the pianist with the perfect technique is also a singer, a first-rate vocalist. The singing voice is the ideal tonal model and aid to phrasing, breathing, and interpretation. And these topics obviously are just barely skimming the surface of what these treatises had. There was only so much that I could fit into an hour. So um, well, I would encourage you to uh, be reading them as well. The next category that I would like to dig into is um, what I, I entitled peripheral. So um, aspects of that, uh, that, that affect teaching or effect teaching, but um, are not necessarily teaching itself. So um, the first uh, comment that I came across quite a bit was attributes of a good teacher. <clears throat> When 18th century pedagogues addressed the topic of what makes a good teacher, a good music teacher, I should say, the treatises I reviewed all tended to agree that a teacher is not required to be the best performer, though the ability to perform well is present. You've probably heard the unfortunate phrase, those who can't teach. However, I do not believe that's what these um, pedagogical treatises are saying. Um, let's see what they say. Turk writes, quote, the teacher, even as if he is not a player of the first order himself, for to teach well and to play superbly are two very different things, must have at least a well-developed sense of musical taste and the ability, to the ability to perform well, aside from the necessary knowledge. And Quantz writes, quote, to be sure, there are some who play the instrument well, or at least passively, Many, however, lack the ability to impart to others that which they know themselves. It is possible that somebody who plays quite well knows little of how to teach. Someone else may teach better than he plays." Quote. From current pedagogy, we can see the same sentiments um, prevailing today. Anthony Williams, again, in that uh, Piano Teacher's Survival Guide that I picked up in Spokane, um, he writes, quote, you don't have to be a top performer to make a good teacher. The best piano teachers are rarely the best performers, too. Playing the piano to a high level will, however, help you understand what is possible and to appreciate the psychological pressures and demands of a top performer. And later he goes on to say, quote, a teacher needs confidence in their own ability and the self-belief and authority to command respect, coupled with the self-awareness that avoids any complacency or lack of adaptability, end quote. Um, so, as I mentioned at the beginning, I would add that it's not that the teacher doesn't have the talent or ability to be a great performer, but that I would just say that um, because teaching is extremely time-consuming, we usually have to spend, um, we spend the most time on what we see the most results in. So, uh, and after all, teaching is a worthy art form in and of itself. It's just um, impossible sometimes to have the time for both. And you might go through seasons where um, you have a lot more time to practice, and so you practice up a recital, and then you go through a season where you really focus on teaching. That's one way to do it, to flip back and forth between them, as I've found in my own work. And then the second peripheral category uh, I'd like to talk about is uh, competitions and playing for feedback. As I was working on this presentation, I was uh, simultaneously serving as a judge for the OMTA state auditions. How many of you all did that in this room? Quite a few, okay. So you'll know uh, what I'm talking about. So naturally, um, I tended to make a note of the historical view of having students play for feedback. Uh, there wasn't there weren't a whole lot of references in the treatises that I read to having the uh, performers play for competitions. Of course, they were quite a bit uh, earlier. I chose uh, all 18th century treatises. There are treatises that 
um, are from the 19th century that I could have um, reviewed as well, and I imagine there will be more of that type of thing uh, in the later uh, pedagogical works. But so I, I kind of broke my rule of uh, finding uh, topics that repeated were repeated across uh, the treatises, and I only found this one um, comment. But it, I think it's a very very good comment and worth sharing. So Turk wrote, "quote So every so often." One should let students play what they have learned in the presence of several, even unknown, persons who are knowledgeable about music. This is of double value. It sustains the pupil's desire to a great, de de a great degree when he has the opportunity to show his progress. At the same time, he gains proper boldness, which many already experienced performers are lacking, much to their detriment. If the little virtuoso, has so presented his pieces that one can be pleased with them, praises coupled with admonitions for further work will be more fruitful at such an occasion than during the usual lesson time. So you can obviously learn even a lot more um, in a uh, competition setting than even in, in one lesson. Um, Louise LaPlay, writing in The Well-Tempered Keyboard Teacher, again a, a more recent resource, she wrote, um, uh, quote, learning how to cope with playing in unfamiliar surroundings before strangers in a judgmental atmosphere provides practice for dealing with the exigencies and pressures of professional life, end quote. And Bastian wrote, quote, students generally benefit from preparing one or more pieces for competition. They receive written comments from judges which aid both students and teachers in preparing for future auditions. And then the last topic that I wanted to touch on with this um, idea of peripheral uh, aspects surrounding teaching is uh, the support of the arts. Uh, the, the support of the arts affects our teaching in one way or the other, so that's why I wanted to talk about that today. So looking at the dedicate, dedication pages of these treatises, I started to notice a pattern of superlative veneration of patrons. Perhaps you've read some of these yourself. Um, Johann Joachim Ponce writes, quote, most serene, great, and mighty king, most gracious king and master, in deepest humility, may I venture to dedicate the present pages to your royal highness, although they contain in part only the first rudiments of an instrument that your highness has brought to such particular perfection. The protection and the high favor which your royal highness has vouchsifted, I don't even know how to say that word, the sciences in general, <laughs> and music in particular, allow me to hope that your royal highness will not refuse the same protection to my efforts also, and that a favorable, favorable eye may be found for that which I have projected here, according to my slight powers in the service of music. This most humble request is united with the most faithful desire for the preservation of your sacred person, all caps, most serene, great and mighty king, most gracious king and master, your royal majesty, your most humble and obedient servant, Johann Joachim Quantz. <laughs> I had to practice that a few times. <laughs> um, and then if we look at Leopold, and all of these treatises uh, tend to have some type of a dedication page like that, where it's like superlative after superlative after superlative, and humility, and uh, please accept humble treatise. Uh, Leopold Mozart wrote, quote, most precious prince and, I'm uh, sorry, most gracious prince and lord, I put a little extra mustard on that one, may I venture to dedicate the humble book of instruction to the eminent name of your grace. And are not rules for the violin too lowly an offering for the mightiness of a prince and primate of all Germany? An instruction book can, in the eyes of a great prince, be no important work. That I know only too well. But I know also that your grace is in the highest degree kindly disposed towards all that contributes to the very least to the instruction of youth and the fine arts. How many people, often endowed with the gifts of nature, would have grown to maturity, untended as the seedlings run wild in the forest, if your right fatherly help had not in good time brought them under the supervision of judicious persons for their upbringing? Uh, he goes on and on and on and ends with a bunch of superlatives um, about <laughs> being humble and most gracious and mighty king and all that. So, uh, from the tone of these dedications, 
we can easily see that the dependence on musicians uh, towards patronage. In Leopold Mozart's case, he was not sugarcoating his praise of his patron. This dedicatee was indeed a fanatical supporter of the arts. Leopold and Wolfgang and also Michael Haydn were all employed in uh, his patron's court orchestra. Uh, but as we tend to see in our own experience, times change, COVID hits, <laughs> um, and situations become much different. Uh, this patron left his finances in such a dismal state that the next prince had to clean up the mess. And in regards to this prince, Leopold wrote a letter in 1777, quote, for the past five years, my son, Wolfgang, has been serving our prince for a miserable pittance in the hope that his efforts and his slight knowledge would in time be appreciated. But we were wrong. I refrain from giving you a full description of the manner in which our prince prefers to think and act. Suffice it to say that he was not ashamed to declare that my son knew nothing and that he ought to betake himself to some conservatorio of music at Naples and study music. And why? Simply in order to make it quite clear that a young man in a subordinate position should not be so foolish as to feel convinced that he deserves better pay and more recognition. Um, so it appears that um, these difficulties in convincing patrons of the necessity of the arts was not limited to the Mozarts. Um, Quantz leaves us with this very sound advice for a musician who wants to survive in this, this thing called music. He writes, quote, furthermore, he who wishes to excel in music must feel in himself a perpetual and untiring love for it, a willingness and eagerness to spare neither industry nor pains, and to bear steadfastly all the difficulties that present themselves in this mode of life. Music seldom procures the same advantages as the other arts, and even if some prosper in it, this prosperity is most often subject to inconstancy change of taste, the weakening of bodily powers, vanishing youth, the loss of a patron, upon whom the entire fortune of many musicians depends, are all capable of hindering the progress of music. Although music is a science that can never be studied and investigated too thoroughly, it does not have the good fortune of other sciences, in part higher, in part on the same level of being taught publicly. I'm not sure what he means by being taught publicly, um, but we get the point. And then he finishes by saying, some cloudy-minded modern philosophers do not, like the ancients, consider knowledge of it a necessity. <laughs> so I think uh, we've all experienced at, at one point or another this idea that music is not as important as the other things. And it can be very, very frustrating. And so for me, when I read that, it was, it was kind of reassuring uh, to feel uh, that um, we're not alone. So, congratulations. You have made it to the end of this presentation and to the bonus category, which is some unusual advice. Um, this is a diagram of wigs from the 18th century, and you will soon find out why I included that in this slide. So, um, the first unusual bit of advice, which may still be applicable to today, but um, was put in such humorous terms that I couldn't not share it with you today, was about mannerisms. Um, I came across this very, very frequently, it repeated across many of the treatises, so um, something very, very interesting. Torque write, quote, distorted facial expressions, writhing, grimaces, or whatever you might want to call them, as well as beating time with the feet, dividing each measure by a motion of the entire body, shaking or nodding of the head, snorting during a trill, <laughs> or during a difficult passage and the like, must never be permitted to the pupil. <laughs> Kubran has some practical advice to overcome this. He says, quote, with regard to making grimaces, it is possible to break oneself of this habit by placing a mirror on the reading desk of the spinet or harpsichord. <laughs> Leopold Mozart, um, he, he thought Turk was funny. Uh, Leopold Mozart makes a complete caricature of this topic. He wrote, quote, there are a great many such bad habits. The most common of these are the moving of the violin, 
the turning to and fro of the body or head, the twisting of the mouth or wrinkling of the nose, especially when something a little difficult is to be played, the hissing, whistling, or any two audible blowing with the breath from the mouth, throat, or nose when playing a difficult note, the force and unnatural distortion of the right and left hand, especially the elbow, he's talking about the violin here, of course, and finally, the violent movement of the whole body whereby the floor or the whole room in which he plays is shaken and the spectators are moved either to laughter or pity <laughs> at the sight of so laborious a wood chopper. <laughs> I was, I think I was laughing out loud when I was, when I came across that. And then the second interesting piece of advice was care of hands, uh, which again was re re uh, repeated quite frequently across the treatises. So I thought I would share that. Uh, Francois Couperin writes, quote, men who wish to attain a great, a certain degree of perfection should never do any rough work with their hands. Woman's hands, on the contrary, are generally better. Sorry. It's like, ooh. All right. <laughs> Tour uh, writes, quote, those persons, particularly males, who wish to learn to play the clavichord, should by no means occupy themselves in work which should make the fingers stiff. <clears throat> Since this is not to be avoided in the case of all music students, one must at least inform them in advance that they cannot be can't become very facile players. Whoever wants to make music, and particularly the playing of the clavichord, his chief occupation, must omit such work by all means, because it is not possible to achieve necessary facility with stiff fingers. I would add, being um, a historical performer myself, I think that this advice um, is much more important for the harpsichord and the clavichord, which have very, very light actions. And I remember when I first started playing these historical instruments, how much finer um, motor motion was necessary for playing those instruments. Um, so I think we can get away with a little bit of rough work on the piano because we, we have much more leeway to really lean into the instrument and um, use bigger muscles. And then the last bit of advice that was quite unusual was about playing the flute in warm weather. Uh, perhaps the most antiquated advice. It comes from <coughs> Quantz. He wrote, quote, in warm weather, it also may happen that he perspires about the mouth and the flute in consequence does not remain lying securely in the proper place. Quickly, to remedy this last evil, <laughs> let the flautist wipe his mouth and the flute clean, then touch his hair or wig, and rub the fine powder clinging to his finger upon his mouth. In this way, the pores are stopped, and he can continue playing without great hindrance. <laughs> so I don't see any of us wearing powdered wigs today, but who knows, everything eventually comes back in fashion. <laughs> in conclusion, some closing thoughts. I hope um, that you've been able to see the strong connection, despite the powdered wigs, that we have as teachers both with each other and also with those, the many who have taught before us. I would like to leave you with this call to action Reginald Gehrig writes, quote, during a period of about four centuries, a large, significant body of technical literature has accumulated on the piano and its predecessors. Much of this bibliography is lost due to many present day piano students and even their teachers uh, through unawareness, uh, lack of time, or inaccessibility. The failure to claim and then assimilate this part of their music heritage is a serious one, end quote. So my call to action is this. Uh, will you be the teacher who keeps a historical treatise or two prominently on the piano to refer to in moments when you feel isolated or just unsure about what you're teaching? Gehrig mentions uh, three possible reasons why we don't look into this material. Unawareness, lack of time, and inaccessibility. Hopefully this presentation has brought some awareness to these great resources, 
Um, in terms of accessibility, I've included a bibliography on the back side of your handout that has all of those uh, treatises that we looked into today listed. Um, and uh, I can't help with, I can't fix the lack of time. That was the one thing that I just couldn't help everybody with. We, we are, we're all very, very busy. But uh, speaking of time, it's time to wrap up this presentation. If you have any questions or want to continue this discussion, please feel free to contact me at the information on this slide. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes, I think, uh, if you want to stick around if anybody has um, questions that you want to uh, bring from the audience as well. But thank you so much for your time today. Does anyone have any questions? So, um, the animations? That too. Yeah. Uh, how do they get what on the power? What specifically? Okay, so I used Keynote. I'm a, I'm a Mac person. I'm a Mac weenie, as they say. Um, and Keynote just had this, um, this nice uh, template that is called Renaissance. If you want to know the theme name. And I thought it worked really well for this presentation. But yeah, the animations um, is again using Keynote, um, using the magic move feature between slides. So is that a software you have to buy? It comes preloaded on a Mac. Yeah, Mac. Yeah, Mac. <laughs> Any other questions? Or is it time for a coffee break? And I'd be happy to talk with you individually as well, or you can send me an email. So, thank you. Thank you.